Good evening. Tonight, what is the artist's role in a violent world? Should artists create a sanctuary from conflict, or should they confront violence and try to understand it? With me to discuss these questions are Vim Venders, the filmmaker whose work ranges from Paris, Texas, to the Buena Vista Social Club. His exhibition of photographs, Pictures from the Surface of the Earth, is currently showing at London's Haunch of Venison Gallery. Nick Cave, the musician and writer, has recently released Nocturama with his band The Bad Seeds. His music has also featured in several of Vim Venders' films. Now, at a time of global conflict, violent images are bound to dominate the news. But violence seems to pervade the rest of our culture, too. Films, television and pop music all dwell on violent images and stories. Are they merely reflecting a violent world, or are they adding to the problem by glorifying and inspiring conflict? Should art help people escape from the often ugly reality? Or is escapism and solitude self-indulgent? Now, Vim Vendors, these images of violence are all around us, even the real-world ones, if you like, on the TV news uh, every night when we watch it, with war in the air. What effect is that having on all of us, do you think? It prepares us, first of all. It makes it look inevitable. And it gives violence some sort of appeal. And the more we see it, the more it has of that appeal. You see, we have violence happening to us in our lives. I mean, I had it happen a couple of times to myself. And then it doesn't have that appeal. Violence, when it happens, is ugly, sometimes very unprovoked. Out of us, it comes very sudden. You're never prepared for it. And afterwards, you think you should have reacted differently. What are the couple of episodes you're referring to? I was. I was once attacked with a knife and once with a gun. But these episodes were so different than, from, than anything I've ever seen in movies. And I acted so differently than I ever saw anybody act in movies that I think the context of violence in real life is so different than the one we are used to in movies. And what movies are giving us a false, almost easy uh, at approach to violence, make it they're seem easier us, than it is? They're giving us a very wrong approach. They're making it look pretty sexy. And violence is ugly. And they also never show us the background. In life, violence has a certain background. It has a social background, a psychological background. There's a reason for it. And I love movies who show violence, who show me the reasons for it. But most of the movies leave the reasons out because they're not so attractive and they just go for the product of violence, and that is a bad thing, I think. Nick Cave, your work is known as being full of, or you read any review, it's always about brooding and menacing. You've done a record called Murder Ballads. Violence in language or imagery is in your work. Are you worried that you're guilty of the kind of thing Vim is talking about, of making it look sort of packaged and less than it really is? Um, first of all, a lot of the violence I have in, in, in my music is comic. Um, there's a sense of humor to it, and and I would, uh, I would think people would see that. But also I, I um, acknowledge a, a violence within myself, and I think that it's, um, violence isn't something out there, it's in here, and it's in us all. Um, <laughs> even, even them. He's backing off. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that it's necessary to be able to, you know, I, I feel it my duty, actually, to, um, to talk about the compassionate side of my nature and the violent side of my nature. Um, and I do that within, <clears throat> within the context of my art. Um, I think we have a choice on, on how we uh, <clears throat> live our life and how we deal with these impulses. But for me, for me my art is uh, the, the arena where I let these impulses play. Rather than acting on them in real well, rather life. Than, rather than acting, acting on them. But when you said that you, what, you, if you're going to have violence in movies, you want it explained and contextualised, I mean, what do you, what's your sort of rule on this? Are you now at a point where you're almost thinking, I just don't want to see violence on screen? Or are you thinking, handled correctly, explained, it actually has a place on the screen? Of course it has a place, because it has a place in life. As Nick explained, it has a place in all of our lives. And I don't know anybody who doesn't know the urge to sometimes become violent. And as long as the urge is shown with it, I, I, can, I like to see it in films. Like Taxi Driver, it's still one of the most violent films ever, even seen today, 20 years later. But it shows all the reasons. It shows where it's coming from. 
in most of the films today, just cut it off. And on TV too, you don't, you see the war images, but you you don't see the background to them. What is the connection between the images that are man that are made in in a movie like Taxi Driver mm. or? which we might talk about in your own film, The End of Violence, where you actually have a kidnapping scene, but it's about movies and violence, partly that film. And the kind of real-world images that we see, oh, for the most iconic now, is that image of 9-11. I remember at least three films where I've seen the towers come down. And the moment when I joined the TV program, that moment when I stumbled into the room because I heard it, was when they, and I thought it was an animation that showed us what could happen. Hmm. And it only sank in much later. And when it did sink in, I mean, I'm still working on it. I'm still, ha I still dream about it. All my childhood, I had dreams of collapsing towers. For, for 20 years, I had recurring night dreams of towers collapsing, and there I saw it, and it slowly sank in. That was happening, and I'm still dreaming of it ever since. So, that was the strangest for me, the weirdest thing that I ever witnessed were these movies, movie images, these digital effects that we continue seeing. I have friends of mine who produce these things. They make houses collapse every day. That's their job. And they don't know how to do their job anymore. They, they, they quit because they, they, they say, no, can't do it anymore. Because the worst we imagined became real. Yeah, and we were so strangely prepared for it. Is this less of an issue for you because you deal with words so much rather than the visual image? Um, I think it is. I think that I, I deal in rock music, basically. And rock music is... Um, you're, you're kind of talking about a responsibility, and rock music, by nature, is supposed to be irresponsible. Um, it's supposed to fly in the face of the status quo and yeah, society. Um, but I mean, I, th I think I think within within the media, where where we we don't see um, the good things that are done, as well. Where, where the the media is violent and, and obsessed with violence, um, and I think there's another side to that. But who, um, I mean, is that a media problem then, or are they feeding some kind of appetite that we all have? I mean, I'm always wondering about this thing where we could, it's quite easy to blame the TV for putting on these images, as if somehow we're quite innocent and wouldn't watch them unless they put them on. But is there a human appetite for this? Well, kind I think of there stuff? is a human appetite for it. I, I know that that exists within me. I know that. I know the way actually I feel when I see certain violent films. When I see a, a, a violent film that's done badly and it's boring and, and there isn't any um, morality beneath it, it's tedious. But, um, but I, know, I know that that there is a part of me that, that is excited by it when I see it, when I see it done well on the screen. There was a part of me that was repulsed by the violence of Taxi Driver, but there was a part of me that was... What, aroused by it in well, some way? Well, no, I, I don't know about aroused by it, but certainly excited by it. Yeah. And... Yeah, it's part, um, of, the, you know, part of our contemporary world. You can't deny it. And as long as it is shown... It's a part, of, part of our nature. Yeah. You know, it's a part of our nature. Oh, much more than just contemporary. You mean it goes way back? Well, I think it does. I think... Um, if we look at the Bible, we look at the life of Christ, for example, we see um, a violent tendency in Christ, a deep rage against things, um, as well as an incredible compassion towards things. Because you've written, haven't you, about the, in fact, you wrote an introduction for an edition of the Gospel according have, to yeah. Mark. Yeah, and one of the things that appealed to you about it was the way it's real and raw in its and violence. And human. And that's something that, uh, rather than we should, th 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 that we reject these, this aspect of our character, we embrace it and try and understand it. On the other hand, there is no more radical approach to violence than in the New Testament, and no more radical approach to aggression, and no more radical negation of it. But you seem to be driving it in some of your films, and also in what have you been saying recently, at some kind of radical response to violence. I mean, even as a title, a film to be called The End of Violence, and to have in it a producer of quite crude action movies who experiences a direct episode of violence in his own life. Are you, w w I mean, I know it would be a misreading to call that film a manifesto of some kind, but what, what are you driving at with, with, with cinema? Are you wanting a kind of radical response that to violence? That thing, I don't know. The title, in hindsight, was a mistake because it made the whole thing too programmatic and people understood it on, on a first degree too much and I regret it. I mean, I wanted it to be a film about violence and the 
the interaction between the producers of violence, so to speak, and when it turns against themselves. So that's why I placed the story into Hollywood and, and had a, this producer become the subject of violence and turn, which turned his life around. And in the end, he's, yeah, he's a, like Saul is turning into Paul. He, he has a complete, he goes into negating it completely and just decides to have a different life. My problem is that I believe less and less that by showing something and you have the best intention to show your disgust or dismay, like a war movie, you have the best intention to make a film against the war. Images don't really carry the intention. They carry themselves. And any war movie, even those great ones, and if there are a handful of great ones, in the end perpetuate the idea of war. And the same with violence. You perpetuate the idea of it even if you are against it. Because people have always said about the Pentagon, for example, yeah. that those planners who staged this thing in the first Gulf War even, that looked like a video game where you were just dropping these things and there would be almost yeah. like a cinematic explosion, exactly. that somehow they had been Joystick. desensitized by watching movies or playing computer games and that that had altered in their mind of what was possible and made war seem more possible. Is that, is that the kind of thought you're having? Yeah, it made war seem so possible that now you can actually plan it and program it and announce it and sort of create a whole new category of wars. The war in Iraq is a new category of war and it will be the forerunner of many wars to come. What do you think about the idea that we might not just have our own violent impulses reflected back to us through art, but that they are actually changing our mind. I know this is in some ways an old debate. Is it, does it reflect what's already there or does it cause it? But what's your view of it? Well, I think that we're, we're uh, often blaming the reflection rather than the thing itself. There are deeper problems underneath all of that that need to be looked at. And, and it's perhaps those, too easy to say well, to the Well, as long as those problems aren't, aren't looked at, we're, we're always going to be be blaming the reflection rather than the thing it's actually reflecting. Because Vim, you've got this idea now, it would be good to explain it, so that there would be a different approach, a so-called cinema of peace. What, what would that be or what would it look like? Uh, if I knew I'd be, I, I'd sleep easier because, <laughs> because, I mean, it just so happens that there is no genre of peace movies because it's more difficult. There is a genre of war movies all through the history of cinema, but there is no such genre as peace movies because peace in itself is let's say it's not so attractive and it might even be boring and we try to conceive of a way to make peace a very attractive and wonderful thing to want and to watch so we're trying to make this project and it's not by me alone it's by many filmmakers worldwide to sort of create sort of an epic of peace as the forerunner of a possible genre of peace movies so I thought we'd have to sort of work against this tidal wave of the other images. How do you rate his chances? Well, <laughs> I, th well I think the problem that with a cinema of peace is that they're, they're, um, unless it's gone about in a completely radical way, there's no storyline, there's no conflict, there's no... Uh, violence propels the story, and uh, conflict propels the story. It makes the air move, you know, it's motion and movement and progress, actually. And that there's no um, drama but or story without But I do know conflict. that with the, with the cinema of peace, there'll be, in a few years after it, any, a, a cinema of ultra-violence again. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be a knee-jerk reaction, just as this is possibly a knee-jerk reaction. What do you say to that? Yeah, fortunately, if you look at the history of cinema, I mean, it never continued in a certain way. It always sort of reversed. And after not having seen movies, where reality matters in any way. I mean, the word real in the 90s was a four-letter word. It's slowly coming back. All of a sudden, you see documentaries re-emerge in, in movie theaters mm -hmm. and a certain need to see something else than fantasy. Would you say to Nick's, Nick Cave's main objection, in a way, that you, what would a cinema of peace be without violence or conflict? There'd be no story. It's what it makes the air move. It's what it's drives us forward. That's why I, I sleep so badly. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's an objection. It's, uh, it's, it would just be a, a, a great difficulty. I think it would be a great thing if it, if it could happen, if you could sit down and, <clears throat> and have a, a movie where you, you want to sit through it and you, you're kept in your seat. Um, of course, conflict is at the know. root of many stories. 
actually it might be the originator of story is conflict. Hmm. You can have it, but it's not... With so could you do a story without a conflict? Because, no, no, not necessarily without a conflict, but um, with, without violence and war, yes, why not? I mean, why not think into it in, in new ways? I think our main responsibility as artists is to offer new ways to approach things and to look at things and to change the way people understand things. I want to ask something about how you both work as artists. I mean, Vim, Vendors, you mentioned that some filmmakers almost can't, watch, can't think of anything anymore. They can't work because 9-11, September the 11th, outstripped their imaginations. Reality got ahead of their imagination. As an artist, do you try, Nick Cave, to screen out, if you like, the day-to-day -day and the news and the TV news and just create a sort of bubble in which you can imagine your songs and your writing? Or do you I actually do. <laughs> feed off that? I do. Well, I mean, I, I go into, uh, you know, I work in an office and uh, that's, w that's what, I, what I call my particular solitude and, my, and it is an escape from reality. Um, so you don't have the TV news on, you don't listen no, to the radio, no. read the papers in the morning? Uh, well, n well, no, I, I live out in the world, obviously, but when I go into the office, it's, it's a place of solitude where I can get in, in contact or with, with my imagination and with magic and with God. Um, and it's, uh, and I guess paradoxically, that is my way of reaching out to, to the world, but I need to be in that particular place. I mean, I throw my songs out to the world and they're kind of lifelines back out to the world. And I do go into this place of solitude with all, my, all the neuroses and fear and angst of, that, that I absorb out there in the world. But, um, but it's absolutely necessary for me to have that, that place of solitude. What about you? For me, it's the opposite. I, at home, I can't think of anything. I have to be out there, I have to be traveling, I have to be on the road in order to think of something. And actually, most of my films are inspired by traveling and by coming to a place and in li liking the place and realizing the place has something to tell. And then I just want to find out the story that this place has to tell. My, most of my stories came out of places and not the other way around, that I had a story and looked for a place to tell it. In. What do you make of that as an idea? I think that you're... I think it's, I think it's a, a wonderful idea. Uh, I think that, um, that place it is very important. But I also think that... Um, well, I think that it's, 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 it's your view of the place. I think there's possibly an arrogance in thinking that the place is something to tell to you personally. It's, 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 um, it's your own personal perception of that place, which is a story, in a way. Because you... Mean, I'm, I'm, refer I'm, I'm referring to an article that I actually read yeah. about the importance of place. Yeah, uh, over, I, over I wouldn't say it if I really didn't had to, didn't have the experience that I've found that places have stories to tell, and that they need somebody to pick it up and yeah. tell it. But you feel as if the place is what bubbling and breathing its own story, and you just are the receiver of this story, rather the than there you are and the impose it. Transmitter and or whatever you want to call it, the messenger boy. But it's there already, the story. I think it's there already. I think most stories are already there. And as artists, we are not modest enough to admit that, that we have found them. Most things that we do as artists is to find things and pretend we've created them. This is intriguing because the two of you have collaborated together, and yet this is a totally opposite view of the creative process, modesty and, and arrogance. And the, I mean, oh, as in, modest people are I'm not most saying that arrogant either at the same time. Of course, but no. the idea that it's there and then you're saying, no, it's something you Make have to... Make maniacs with low yeah. self-esteem. That you have to, that you actually <laughs> impose it, whereas Vim feels he uncovers it. These are very different approaches, aren't they? Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, Hopefully. I mean, you, you, you sound like to me and I, uh, uh, that you have a, a different feeling uh, towards nature. Um, I'm actually, w w in regard to raw nature, um, incredibly intimidated by it um, and, feel, and feel that I'm kind of corrupting it in some way. Whenever, where, you know, I find sunsets depressing and deserts intimidating and, you know, the Australian bush downright terrifying. Because what, it's spoiled by you being in it? Well, I feel, I feel I don't belong. I just feel I don't belong. For me, that was the biggest revelation in my life was Australia, to, to arrive in the Australian outback 
that set me free to become who I am. And it was the, the original peoples, the indigenous people of Australia, who taught me the biggest lesson how to deal with nature and with places, which was you can never own them. You have no right to, to sell them or change them or, or w the, what we do in our Western world with places. We sell them. We sell them for a better price than we buy them. We do anything that we want. We dig. We change them. We, we put highways through. We photograph them. We photograph them. That's a good thing. <laughs> but That's OK. I'm just, it's on. OK if, if you, by taking the photograph, you're not, you're, you don't have the attitude that you can take the place away. You can't steal it so. And anyone who's seen Paris, Texas knows about your connection with the desert and just letting it linger in our imagination, letting us just see it. But I want to talk a bit about place because you're both out, for, out of your place in a way. I mean, you're living in right countries, uh, <laughs> living in countries where you're not from. I mean, you're a German in Los Angeles. I thought this was about violence in the art world, and now it's art in the violent world. Oh, it is. I'm going to, particularly though, I'm going to unfortunately come to something very violent, which is your relationship with with Ground Zero. You went there yeah. in November of, uh, of 2000, or very soon after. 9/11 happened. What was your because you, these places that tell you story? What was what, what did what did you take from seeing that? I just did everything I could to get there and photograph because I couldn't overcome it. I didn't know how to deal with it. As I told you, I I dreamt about it every day, every night, and and I had the incredible chance that I was let in and with my camera because there were no more photographers allowed. And uh, Joel Majerovic, who was who became the mayor's official photographer in order to be able to continue mm. day by day taking his pictures, and he has been doing it from the first day until it until the works were finished. He managed to take me in as his assistant, and uh, I was interested in th what has happened to the place. I mean. Of course, there's many levels you, you can be interested in, and that can be a thing that you want to do, take pictures. But I wanted to see a place that was so wounded. How, how would that show? And how could I react as a photographer? And the, the unbelievable thing that happened to me on that morning was that I saw that the place was healing. And I took my photographs because I knew that that was something that had to be shown that the place was actually healing in the midst of all the terror and the horrifying pit, hell pit that it was. It was really, I've never in my life felt that I really was, had descended into hell like, like in mythology. Mm. And there, right there in the middle of the hole, I felt the place had no, knew how to heal. And it was already beginning. So this was a wound that was beginning to close over almost. It was beginning to close over, and it was also beginning to show us how healing would, could be done. But is that still your view? It's nearly, well, it's 18 months on. And what is your view now? My view is still that there is an unbelievable lesson in there that we can learn from and that we can try to follow. Do you but think America is drawing that first, lesson from? My first reaction in America, the first few months afterwards, was that it had an incredible impact on American people all over the world, by the way. Mm. It had an incredible impact of solidarity. And, and if you went to New York, New Yorkers were tender with each other. There mm. was a fragility. There was a lesson that was being learned. And that lesson afterwards became unlearned again. You, I know, try and sort of insulate yourself in a way from these sorts of current events, but everybody has been had their imaginations invaded by that event. I think. What's your take? I on mean, it's it's very difficult. It becomes for me, it becomes more and more difficult to keep that stuff out. Um, and and I and for me personally, I feel I have to be more and more vigilant about it. I mean, I I was in the office the next day. Um, I mean, I go into the office every day and write, and I was in there the next day, and it was difficult. It was. You know, it was incredibly confusing, um, but I feel, for me, it, it's it's uh, it's a matter of my own survival, and the the creative process uh, is extremely important to me, and it's a matter of survival. Have you noticed, though, anyway, despite the vigilance to keep it out, that it has sort of leaked into your imagination? Well, and if it has, what form has it taken? Well, I'm not sure. I'm Too not early sure. to tell, in a way. Well, you know, I mean, I can't 
go into into my office and you know and stand there kind of naked and and be free of everything mm. you're not I, I i drag myself in there uh, which I, which is which is what i was saying before um but i do i do feel a certain comfort of entering an alternate world of the of, of my imagination where i cr create my own characters there's a certain kind of logic to to the way that they perform within the songs um they're largely narrative songs mm. Um, and it's the same feeling. It's the same feeling as as I got and the security I got as a child, really. When when I read books, there was a certain kind of logic to the stories. Not that I had a, and I would escape into that. Not that I had a bad childhood or anything, but there was. It made sense to me. But if I listen to your music, I feel there's a very strong urge for tenderness as well, and there is something that was always there but not so present that there is like an outburst of positive energy and of love also in them, although you do sometimes describe the opposite. Well, I think, I would hope so, yeah. yeah. Is this I mean, something I you've mean, noticed in Nick's work since September 11th? Not period. necessarily since, but over the last few years, it's very obvious for me. And for me, I think that was one of the necessary conclusions was to concentrate on tenderness and to concentrate on positive things and to concentrate on bringing something that I thought was be beginning afterwards. Like they pulled a lot of movies off the shelf at the time because they felt it wasn't the right moment, luckily. But it turned out they were just waiting until it was the right moment again. And my hope was that something more at the base had changed, but it didn't actually. Sometimes these historical chances to change something radical are not taken by by the world and that was one of those chances like the german reunification was a historical chance to change something in this country the chance was pissed away all right on that rather mournful note our thanks to our guests Vim vendors oh, and nick caves if you'd like to say. comment on the issues raised in this evening's program do log on to our website it's at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash talk show. I'll be back at the same time next week, but for now, from me, Jonathan Friedland, goodbye. Next tonight, one of the most controversial, colourful broadcasters ever. Time Shift looks at Malcolm Muggeridge in a moment.